Part of the controversy in the shack was that it had a wider view of salvation than many Christians are comfortable with. In one moment, Jesus responds to Mac asking a version of the famous question, do all roads lead to heaven? Jesus says, most roads don't lead anywhere. What it does mean is that I will travel any road to find you. So can you explain what that means a little bit? Sure. Now, the statement that you began with is that, you know, a lot of people, it had a wider view than a lot of people. Let's let's just um, step back. There are 350 million Orthodox followers of Jesus who absolutely believe that the wider view is the true view. So um, that is basically the population of the United States spread across the world. So when we talk about people having, you know, that a lot of people have a narrower view of salvation, we're talking about the West, we're talking about, you know, the Celtics have no problem with this. You know, that whole movement from the early church that went down through the Celtic side of things, they don't have a problem with this. Um, the, the idea that everyone was included in Christ in the death, resurrection, and ascension, which is basic scripture, is what is held by the majority of followers of Jesus on the planet. And we're the minority that make it small. So just for perspective's sake, um, I'll go down any road to find you. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right? So we, we're off on this path. We're off, you know, um, I had a conversation with a young gal who is a foreign exchange student, um, going back to Indonesia and she's from a Buddhist family and her host father knows me and she didn't know that he knew me and she, she was wrecked in a good way by the shack and then became part of her youth group in the church and stuff like that. And um, so he surprised her a couple weeks before she went back because she'd said on her bucket list she wanted to meet the author of the shack. So we sat at St. Arbucks by the airport and um, and uh, talked for two hours. And at the end, she said, you know, my friends and the youth group, they're starting to say that they're going to be praying for me now that I'm going home because um, now that I'm a Christian, uh, they're going to be praying that I'll be able to make a stand um, against my family and Buddhism. Because, And she said, you know, I've gone to the Buddhist temple every Sunday um, my whole life with my grandma because I love my grandma. She says, like a lot of young people, even in Christianity, they don't hold on to the tenets of their tradition that deeply, right? Said she didn't either, but, but she said, but my family is all sincere Buddhists. So what do I do? And I said, well, this is a really easy question. Um, don't, don't be a Christian, right? Be a Buddhist follower of Jesus. And she said, you're allowed to do that. And I said, of course. I said, I know Christians who are followers of Jesus. And, uh, and I know a lot of Muslims who are followers of Jesus, right? The category Christian, right? Jesus was never a Christian. It's a category that we've created to lump people into. And when Paul says, I am all things to all people, he's not saying I'm a Christian, right? And that's what, that's what marks me off. He's saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus is at the center of everything. I don't care what you call yourself. And I said, look, ask the Holy Spirit, like, should we go to the temple uh, this week with grandma? Don't be surprised that he says, sure. Like, you're not going to be going into a place that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are already not. You're not going to be relating to your grandma as if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit don't live in her, exist in her, that she moves and has her being in her, Acts 17. Right. So, so ask the Holy Spirit because you don't need to culturally divide the family over categories. You really don't need to do that. We've done that to all kinds of people and all kinds of families and in devastating ways. And sometimes it works that way anyway, just because we're followers of Jesus, you know. And, uh, but again, 
What are we talking about here? We're talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christ. Who, who came that the world would be saved. God in Christ reconciled the cosmos to himself, not counting their sins against them. And, and so Jesus, who loves us, will go down any road to find us, even Christian roads, even legalistic roads, even very narrowly defined roads, or Orthodox, or Catholic, or Buddhist, or Muslim, or on and on and on. You know, how many stories have you heard about Jesus actually appearing to Muslim people? Not just in dreams, but in face-to-face -face relationships lots right so so you know what are we going to do hide in our corner we have forty-four thousand denominations already like you know we really don't need any more and um and they're all broken up because of little doctrinal differences what unifies us it's the nature and character of father son and holy spirit revealed in jesus you look at G you look at jesus you see the father he says i'm the i and the father are one Right. There is a relationship that exists that holds the entire cosmos together. And the intention of, of Jesus was not to come in order to divide people into denominations. It was to come so that the world through him would be saved. And I, I'm like, yeah, the kindness of God is that God will go down any road to find me. I could be on a road. I could be on the Christian road and be completely lost in terms of the love of God and the presence of God in my life. I'm stuck in the legalism of performance, perfectionism, and I don't know how much I'm loved. You know, how much different is that than a Muslim who believes that the word is the one through whom everything was created and the word is Jesus. And they got all kinds of other stuff attached to it, but so do we. And, and it's like, so would Jesus go down the Muslim road to find a Muslim? No question. I have friends who are Muslim followers of Jesus. No question. Buddhist road, no question. Christian road, no question. Right? This is, this is the one who'll leave the 99 to go find the one. And I'm the one. And you're the one. And so... That's the expansive nature of the love of God. And we've just closeted our concept of God in a very small container, which has not been a limitation to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a lot going on in this world that didn't depend on how safely we kept God in the box. You know, I think the Holy Spirit's constantly at work with us inside the kinds of traditions that we have. And, and you see that in what we call the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures. You see that where God is working with people who do not understand. You know, the almost killing of Isaac is an example of God saying, I want to teach you that I hate sacrifice and I really hate child sacrifice. And if you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. So from now on, you can call me Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide himself. And so this is an education process, right? Abram had no clue about most things. He, he, there was no Bible school where Abraham grew up. There was a moon god and goddess worshiping center. You know, that was the church that he went to. He just suddenly started hearing a voice inside that said, get out of town. And it was so loud in his own consciousness that he got out of town he had no idea where he was going he had, he took all of his idols with him you know why because that's what you do idols gods are territorial if i take my idol with me then everywhere i go i'm going to be covered by that deity right you th you think that abraham knew what was going on absolutely not and so it was a slow incremental educational process and the beauty of a God revealed in Jesus is that this is a God who will submit, which, which is anathema to some of my people. It's like God's all-powerful and all this. 
God doesn't submit. What do you think washing feet is about? What do you think? What do you think about that? God has never come into your life and made a decision for you, right? We'd love Him to do that, but then if you think about Him, we wouldn't want God to do that because that would be the annihilation of a relationship in which we have personal agency. And then where does it stop? If God makes one decision on your behalf because you're bad at it, where does it end? And love is annihilated, right? So <sighs> the scriptures are an education process. The, the prophets are saying things differently than those who came before them. There are people that actually believed, like Samuel, he had a revelation of God, but he also believed that God was telling him to kill people, including babies. You know, the disciples show up and go like, they get kicked out of this town. Again, and Jesus is submitting. He's like leaving town. And, uh, and they go, can we call down fire from heaven? W what's he talking about? Elijah, right? Or Elisha, one of the two of them. And, uh, and God turns to them and rebukes them. He says, you don't even know what spirit you're of, right? This is the, I don't call down fire from heaven. I don't give people a virus that kills them. I don't give people cancer. I don't cause defects in babies, right? This is not a God who harms life. This is a God who is life and who is good. And if you can't see Jesus in every circumstance and that God is good, then you're looking at it wrong. You're looking at it wrong. And yet, you know, we have that lens. And so we're trying to deal with scripture literalistically. And we come up with a God who is dangerous, nefarious, you know, untrustworthy when in the final analysis, or who loves in a way that is different than the way I love my children. I mean, radically, so that somehow God is able to love you and kill you. Right? How, how can you trust that? And, and I'm saying you can't. So you can you can give lip service to it and you can work under a sense of enslavement to it, trying to make sure that you get in so you don't burn, you know, an eternal conscious torment. But it's not a relationship of trust.